Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Texas Science Festival's virtual session, An Immense World, in conversation with Ed Young about all that lies beyond our human sensory bubble. My name is Julie Burwald, and I'm a science writer and author, and I'll serve as moderator for today's session. I'm truly delighted for this opportunity because all of these panelists share something so important. They help us understand through our admittedly limited capacities a little more about what it's like to be in the bodies of other creatures with whom we share this planet. And not just the ones we see around us all the time, our cats and our dogs and our squirrels and our birds, but the real brilliance, I think, of thinking about the world through the lens of senses is that it's a way to connect with the animals that we consider less frequently the sap sucking insects and the frogs and the damselfish and the swordtails. And especially now in, this, in these polarized times, I think it's a real gift that these panelists share with us to contemplate this expanded version of perception. Because I think if we can bring an understanding to those animals that we think of as so different, we can certainly use that to build connections to those who are actually so similar to ourselves. Before I introduce our panelists, I want to give some light housekeeping. First of all, the chat is disabled. We will have good, a good amount of time for Q&A after the conversation. So submit your questions view, via the Q&A function at the bottom, and then upvote the questions that you like. Today's talk is being recorded, and it will be shared on the College of Natural Sciences YouTube channel. And now I'm excited to welcome our panelists, Ed Young, um, as well as a pair of evolutionary biologists from the University of Texas at Austin, whose work is featured in Ed's latest books. So Ed is a science journalist. Um, he writes for The Atlantic, and he is the author of two wonderful books, An Immense World, How Animal Senses Reveal the Hidden Realms Around Us, as well as I Contain Multitudes. He has won many awards for his coverage of the COVID-19 pandemic, including the Pulitzer Prize in Explanatory Journalism and the AAAS Kavli Science Journalism Award for in-depth reporting. He's the author of the two uh, New York Times bestsellers that I mentioned. And um, the book we're gonna be talking about today is about the extraordinary sensory worlds of other animals. And it was listed as one of the top 10 books of 2022 by the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. And it was named as a finalist for the Carnegie Medal and the Kirkus Prize and the Los Angeles Book Awards. So thanks for being here, Ed. Um, I'm next gonna introduce Molly Cummings, who is a professor of integrative biology at UT Austin. She, um, she uses fish as model organisms to investigate basic mechanisms underlying biological processes, ranging from camouflage to brain pathways involved in navigating complex social interactions. She is also a gin entrepreneur, the founder, um, and also wild juniper forager for the wild june and checker park, checker bark gins, which I can attest are absolutely delicious. And we have Mike Ryan, who is a also a professor of integrative biology at the University of Texas at Austin. He is the Clark Hubbs Regents Professor in Zoology, a senior research associate at the Smithsonian Tropical research, in research Institute in Panama. He researches sexual selection, mate choice, and animal communication, including in frogs. And he is the author of A Taste for the Beautiful. And he is also a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and the Guggenheim Foundation. So I'm just really great, excited to listen to your conversation. I'm going to pop out of here, let you guys talk for a while, and I think Mike's going to kick it off. Thanks, Julie. Thanks, Thank you, Julie. Uh, thanks, Julie. So we're all excited to do this, and just let me start off Ed, by saying what it really, what a joy it was to read that book in uh, so many ways. And honestly, I was surprised that I learned so much <laughs> from this book, frankly. It was just filled with interesting facts, but also uh, narrated in such a charming way. 
So you Thank open you. you open the book by introducing this concept that not even all biologists are familiar with this idea of the Umwelt. <laughs> so can you just can you just give us an idea of um, what this is, what the Umwelt means? Sure, and uh, I'm glad we're starting here because this is really the underpinning concept for the entire book. So um, the word Umwelt was um, popularized um, in this in this context by. Uh, a German zoologist named Jakob von Uxko um, in the early 20th century. And the word itself is simply German for environment. But von Uxko wasn't just refer using it to refer to the physical environment. So my umbelt is not the lamp behind me. It's not the desk that I'm touching right now. The umbelt is the sensory bubble in which we are all um, trapped. It is the specific cocktails of sights and sounds and textures and other stimuli that we can perceive, but that other creatures might not be able to. And the, the Uxell's core um, realization was that each animal has its, has its own unique sensory bubble, its own umbelt, its own sliver of reality that it can sense, and that that sliver is going to be radically different from the other species or perhaps even the other individuals around it. So, for example, um, if there was um, a rattlesnake in this room, it could sense the infrared radiation being um, given off by my, my hot body, um, something that I can't can't sense myself. Um, a robin in this room would be able to detect the Earth's magnetic field and use that to navigate on its long migrations. Again, something that I cannot sense. Um, but for example, my, um, uh, you know, I, I can see colors um, that my dog, uh, his name is Typo, he's a corgi, um, uh, does not perceive. So each creature is limited in some ways, each creature is liberated in others, um, and we're all different. It feels as if our perception of the world is complete. You know, I'm, I'm sitting here, I'm not feeling like holes in my awareness, but that sense of completeness is an illusion and it's one that each creature shares. And I think that this idea of, of the umwelt, of, of this sensory bubble, it's truly one of the most profound and beautiful in biology. Um, you know, it's, it shows that it, it's a very leveling force and, and Uxkull intended it in that way. Um, you know, he, he saw it as a way of showing that um, every creature has limitations and even humans for our vaunted intelligence and, you know, our technological capacities and, and all of that we are still missing a huge amount of what is in our everyday reality. Um, including things that a lot of other um, other creatures around us, dogs, birds, insects, uh, are indeed sensing. Absolutely. And I would just like to, um, before we get into further questions, start with a little praise. <laughs> oh, thank you. Similar to Mike, I was blown away with how much I learned in your book. It was truly amazing. And I'd just like to say, you might have to rename for the second edition of your book. Uh, instead of, you would have a second book and it might be, I contain multiple awards. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Because perfect, it's, perfect. It's, it's <laughs> deserving. Um, you, you know, it it was it. I actually did really want to write a book that even scientists in the field would get something thing new out of. Like I, th I think you know, you you. I think you two will know this better than I do. But I think uh, my experience is that most people in this field, um, because of the nature of modern science, you spend a lot of time diving into, if not one particular organism, then like one particular modality. You know, you might be a, a vision scientist or a hearing scientist, or you might study tongue of frogs um, for your for your whole career. Um, and and I think that I, I really wanted to do something that that um, that extended across the whole animal kingdom and across all of these different modalities and compared and contrasted across them um because i think that there's there's a lot of there's a lot of magic in that and um you know i i it, I, I hope that for someone who has no background in science at all that the book will be fascinating but for people who breathe this stuff day in and day out like the two of you it will also hold you know th things that are new and and exciting absolutely and i just want to point out that you are probably inspiring a whole new generation of scientists that are going to take the sensory ecology to the next level. Because oh, my start in sensory ecology by was reading one book, 
about one modality. I read Jonathan Lithgow's Ecology of Vision and it absolutely inspired me to become a vision sensor ecologist. Meanwhile, you've taken, you introduced us with an elephant in the room. <laughs> and then you take us through chapters where an entire Noah's Ark filled of animals describe this elephant in beautiful ways. And your book really invites compar comparisons between the senses in ways that I certainly was never trained to do. Uh, Mike's done more of it than I have, but it's just, I really think you are going to inspire the next, um, you know, Nobel Prize winner in ecology. <laughs> so. Thank you. I, I hope so. That would, that would be nice. That would make me feel, that would make me feel very good. I think it's a, a lovely cycle of like, um, you know, I, I've gained so much uh, talking to and, and listening to um, folks like yourselves. And I think, you know, to be able to give back to the field in that way would be very meaningful. You know, I'd like to pick up on this idea that Molly just brought up of um, comparing these sensory modalities, uh -huh. because I think you are right that a lot of uh, us who do this for a living, we tend to focus on one. And so some of the sensory modalities differ amongst different species, including us, by the range of yeah. sensation. So yeah. we cannot, we can hear, but we can't hear these uh, low frequency sounds made by elephants, as you point <laughs> out, nor can we hear ultrasonic uh, echolocation calls of bats. Yeah. But we can kind of imagine what it would be like a little bit if we could shift our hearing range. And it's the same thing with vision. We can't see ultraviolet, but we can see purple. So we can kind of imagine. But what about something like gravitation uh, I'm sorry, about um, magnetic orientation. How do you even go about thinking about that modality when you can't even imagine really what it would feel like? Yeah, I, I think, um, mag so magnetoreception, the ability to sense the Earth's magnetic field is um, probably the, I, I would argue the hardest sense to study and probably the least the one that we still know the least about it was discovered in um I didn't say like the 50s like the mid the mid 20th century um and there's been a lot of work on which animals have it so we know that sea turtles can sense the earth's magnetic field we know that a lot of migrating songbirds can even some very simple insects like these bogong moths in Australia that go through long cross-country migrations can sense the Earth's magnetic fields. But but what is that like? You know, with vision, I know that my eyes are involved with ear, with hearing. It's my ears. But what is the organ that senses the Earth's magnetic field? There are, there are a few ideas, but there are still no no solid answers. I think you know the 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 um, and that's very unusual. It's it's the only sense for which there isn't really. Um, a receptor for which the sense organ is not known and without that you don't really know exactly how it works and without that you can't it's really hard to imagine what it would be like um so the, the reason why this is all very hard i think uh, there are several firstly magnetic fields are very counterintuitive you know i can i can roughly explain to you how sound works and how, how light works but you know explaining how magnetism works is actually very hard and and we, because it's not something we sense, it's not a stimulus that we have any intuitive um, understanding of. And it's also quite difficult to, um, to duplicate. Um, and, and so, um, and, and also there's the fact that magnet, the Earth's magnetic field like pervades living tissue. It, it goes right through our bodies. So unlike a lot of other sense organs like eyes and ears, which need to be on the surface of the body because otherwise they would be blocked by flesh and bone, a magnetic sensor could be anywhere. It could be in the middle of my chest. It could be in my toe. It could be in, in the middle of my chest and in my toe, right? It could be dispersed throughout the entire body. We don't really have even the, the, a basic clue for what it would take, um, where, where a kind of sensory organ for a magnetic field would be. Like, we know these animals have the equivalent of a compass. What is it? Where is it? How does it work? I talk about some possible explanations in the book, but there aren't really any answers. I think one of my favorite ideas is this, this idea that the in, in birds, at least, the compass um, exists in their eyes, and it depends on these molecules that are activated by light. 
Um, and so you might imagine that maybe like a, a songbird flying through the, flying through the sky can kind of see the Earth's magnetic field. Maybe it maybe it works a bit like that. Maybe it has a kind of heads up display. Maybe north is um, a, a, a dark patch, or, or um, you know, there, there's some kind of thing that overlies its vision that tells it where it's headed. But that is a, a wild and, and random stab in the dark for me. You know, I, I like to imagine it, but, but I don't know for sure. Now, this is, I think, an extreme example, but I think this is the same problem that applies to the, the entire field. Like, you know, you, the, the two of you and your colleagues can do um, incredible experiments to really pin down what kinds of things animals are perceiving and how they behave in response to those things. But that, that like, crucial philosophical question like what is the animal actually experiencing what is it feeling what is its subjective experience of the world i think that is almost impossible to answer there's there's always going to be that gulf between our experience and theirs and science and research can take us very close to the edge of that gulf but to cross it i think that you need we always need feats of what um, Alexandra Horowitz calls informed imaginative leaps. Um, you know, that's taking everything you know and just kind of speculating wildly about, about um, what, what these creatures are going through. Um, and I think that's, that's another reason I love it. It's, it's sort of blending, um, you know, the, the hard empiricism that, that science is rooted for, uh, is known for, with, I think, a lot of the creativity and imagination that we don't talk about so much um, in, in academia, but that every good scientist is really just tapping into all the time. Uh, would you, would you to agree with that? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. In fact, I'd love to, you, your chapter on electrical signals inspired <laughs> me to make lots of speculative leaps that I'd love your thoughts on. So I had okay. no idea that insects were picking up on the electrical charges of flowers that's just mm -hmm. mind-blowing right and it made me wonder i mean both mike and i work on signal evolution yeah and you you bring up this very provocative idea that uh perhaps flowers are potentially creating electrical deceitful signals to bees mm -hmm. to get them to come visit well, I'm also curious, do, do, does sexual selection exploit this particular Ooh. sensory realm? Do males produce electrical gradients that females are evaluating them on? Or do they produce deceitful gradients to get females to visit them or vice versa? I, I just feel this is incredibly new and exciting realm. And it certainly puts we big lumbering primates in our humble place because we have no way to detect these really minute gradients and it's was just so exciting so yeah and, and i i i agree it's so exciting and um you know that that whole area of um insects and arthropods and, and land-based mammals being able to detect the electric fields of things like flowers is is new right i think i remember writing about one of the first discoveries on this about a decade ago I want to say like 2030, like roughly 10 years ago. Um, and, and before that, people for very old, for very good reasons thought that the ability to sense electric field was going to be completely limited to the water. It's going to be, it's going to be only in electric fish and sharks and platypuses because water is very conductive and the air is, is simply not. But, but now it does seem as if bees can sense the electric fields that go around flowers. They can tell the difference between different shapes of electric fields. If they land on a flower, they're going to change the electric field. So a bee might be able to tell whether a flower has been recently visited by another bee based on those fields. So as you say, yeah, it opens up this whole world of, of questions, of, of signaling, of communication, of deceit and, and honesty. And it's, you know, it, it's that, I, I love that, we can obviously see flowers we look at flowers we find them beautiful they um the colors are interesting we might be able to smell them but the idea that you know with with something as familiar and as as um as uh, lovely to us as a flower that there's this whole other aspect of of signaling that we might have missed all this time and can and can barely even begin to speculate about that's incredible to me um and you know, I think this this whole area of, of electro reception of sensing electric fields, 
has a lot of qualities like that. Um, you know, electric fish, there, there are a lot of electric fish, um, in, especially in uh, Africa and South America that produce their own electric fields and that can sense the electric um, fields of themselves uh, and of other electric fish and sometimes of other living things too. Um, they use this sense to navigate in the, in the world around them. You know, Mike talked about, about range. This is a little bit like if you extended the sense of touch on your skin about like an inch out from you, you know, you could, you could feel as you move past um, an object and you could tell like whether that object was say a living thing like this plant that I'm now touching or inanimate like the pot be below it. But the thing that I think is incredible about electric fish, and I still can't really wrap my head around, is they are producing their own electric fields, and they are using those fields to sense the world. They are also producing electric fields as a way of communicating to other fish. So they're sending out these fields as signals that other electric fish can detect, and it's their way of trading messages like birdsong. Right? But the fields that they produce to sense the world and the fields they produce to talk to other electric fish are the same. So if one changes, if you change the nature of those fields for the sake of communication, it also changes what the fish can perceive. Like a really simple example of this is when electric fish, some electric fish fight, they have a submission signal that, that when they when one loses, it will just stop producing electric fields as as a kind of you know white flag. But because those are the same fields the fish use to sense their environment, it also means that then their perception shuts down. Um, so this world in which perception and communication are are not separate things, but are actually deeply intertwined, and you can't change one without the other is wild to me. I, I you know, I, I, I think you could, you know, you could just spend happy days just thinking about what the implications of that are, are, are for the lives of these animals, let alone like the long, the big scale evolutionary consequences of that. Um, and that's, that's one, one of the things I love about this, this field, this topic, like every little thing just opens up this vast array of um, you know, thoughts, questions, speculations. Um, it, it's just sort of endless and anything very delightfully so. Well, uh, one of the things that you talk about in the book is um, when animals are plugging into different sensory modalities simultaneously. So mm -hmm. for instance, you know, the infrared detectors in a rattlesnake map fairly well onto the visual field. Mm -hmm. So one, one modality seems to enhance the function of the other modality. But what I was wondering is, does it seem likely, or maybe you know of some cases where too much, where more information might actually be too much information? So for example, uh, at least I do this, if I'm, if I'm navigating to, in some area where I'm not familiar with the roads and I'm looking for a street sign, I turn down the radio. Now that should have no relationship to my ability to see the signs, but it just seems that you wanna shut down other sensory modalities when you're focusing on one. Yeah. Is, have you come across any evidence of, uh, of too, too much information through multiple modalities might sometimes not be a good thing. That's interesting. Like when and one sense says, interferes with another. Um, yeah, like a sensory overload, maybe think of, we could think about. Well, so I, I think about this, I, would, I, think I, I think about this question in a couple of ways. Like I feel, I think it's, maybe I'll, maybe I'll go back on this later, but, but for my, my gut reaction is, I, I think that there are probably going to be fewer cases where like where it's like the senses are directly interfering with each other, like one is jamming the other, and you you need to sort of shut um, shut something down to 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 really focus on on um, on the on an alternative. I think it's more that animals like us, us and other animals are, are limited in our attentional capacities. Like we we like the senses give us a lot of information and we are the then the 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 crunch point is our ability to process and deal with that information so mm -hmm. you know the, to, to me like the turning down the radio to focus on on the sign it isn't because the the noise you know you you 
the your ears are jamming your eyes it's that right. it's really hard to pay attention to all these things at once um and you know and i think that we I think that the brain often goes for efficiency and for shortcuts when it can. Um, so you can see this for like, there, there are lots of funny, so um, so bats um, are, you know, very famed for their incredible echolocation abilities. Um, so they produce high pitch frequent, high frequency noises, uh, calls, and they sense the world by listening out for the echoes that come back um, as those calls bounce off objects around them. Um, their, their skill at doing this is, is uh, incredible, right? So bats can navigate through dark corridors and avoid obstacles. They can pluck insects out of the air. They can snatch spiders from their webs. Um, you know, they can fish. They can they can do all kinds of incredible things with their sonar. But they'll also make very dumb mistakes um, from time to time. Like there's there's a lot of very sad stories of people putting up like barricading the door, the like the entrances of mines. Um, for safety, for human safety reasons, and finding like a pile of dead bats because they've just crashed into the door. Now, an animal with the, the sensory skill of a bat should absolutely be able to see a giant door in front of them, but they often don't because they're not really, when they make that mistake, it's that they're just going off, they're flying off memory, they're flying off some other sense, they're not actually paying close attention to all of the information that their incredible senses give them, which is a bit like what humans do, right? That it's the same reason why most car accidents happen close to home. Um, it's, it's not that your eyes suddenly fail or your ears fail, it's that what you do with that information it differs um, under those circumstances. And then, you know, I think that the, the other example that I was thinking of in, with your question is, I think there are, there are, so animals are always using information from multiple senses at the same time. Um, but I, I can, I can certainly think of examples where those, that information might um, conflict or might not be processed together. So um, the, what I'm thinking of is an octopus. Um, an octopus has um, almost like two different umdalten. So it's got the head where the eyes are. Um, and that does, uh, you know, pretty good sharp vision. And then there are the limbs and the limbs um, live in a world of taste and touch. The suckers can feel and taste probably in some weird combination of those two senses. And the arms have probably three fifths of the neurons in the animal's body. And to, an, to a degree, they operate independently. Um, of the brain like there is some connection but the arms have a surprising degree of agency that like my hand does not have I'm doing this because I'm telling my fingers to wiggle my fingers are not just like going off their own thing but an octopus can kind of do that you know a, a, an arm can reach out grab explore taste touch um, and meanwhile the head and maybe other parts of the octopus are doing something else so here you have a, a, an animal with a very distributed nervous system where i think it is possible for like one sensory stream to be conveying information that doesn't affect this other like this completely different body part which is relying on a very different set of senses over here um and you know again that i think very much stresses taxes the imagination um mm -hmm. I, I think it, you know there's the classic essay of what is it like to be a bat um by thomas nagel i think it's very hard what is it like to be an octopus is uh it's considerably harder i think you did a great job describing what it's like to be an octopus in the, oh, thank in the you. chapter i thought it was uh extremely well done and made me think about all sorts of things Mike, I don't know as much about the human brain as I know about the fish brain, but I do know that um, fish brains kind of conflate odorants and visual information. So maybe it's something like what Ed's talking about, mm -hmm. like information overload, and you want to allow one stream of, of and allow this stream of the sensory world to be processed fully without interference. Yeah. Um, well, in the, in the human optic tectum, which you know, has homologs and other vertebrates, we tend to think of it as a center for visual processing, but that's you know, one of the first places in the brain where you start to get these different mo modalities coming together and uh, decisions, quote unquote, decisions being made on how to wait, 
how to weight those different those different exactly. modalities. Absolutely. Yeah, and, you know, I, I I write in the in the so in the chapter on echolocation, I talk about um, people. Uh, who, humans who can who are blind and who can actually echolocate too, um, and you know with that, their their skills are in the in not as advanced as a bat because they bats have several hundreds of millions of years of head start. But I've you know met um, uh, uh, one a human echolocator named Daniel Kish, and he's very good at clicking his way around his neighborhood and sensing what is around him. Um, neuroscience studies. Um, on Daniel and other human locators show that they use um, their visual cortex to um, navigate through space. Um, you know, it's, it's um, and, and I make this point in the book, like we, we call this part of the brain the visual cortex because in most of it, it's, it, most of us, it processes visual information. But if you take vision away, you're suddenly using um, the same part of the brain to process um, the information from what seems like a completely different sense. It feels like hearing, but it's for the same purpose. It's for moving through the world and getting a spatial understanding of it. So like, to what extent is this, uh, you know, we call this the visual cortex because most people are sighted and, and we are biased by that main sense. But to what extent is it just like a spatial navigation cortex that usually happens to be plugged into your eyes? But can very easily be plugged into something else. Um, you know, the, I think one of one of the things I, I loved um, talking about and writing about with this book are the, are the ways in which our senses um, distract us or, um, or or you know uh, or mislead us in thinking about our bodies, other animals, what other animals are experiencing, or, or all of it. Um, you know, it, it's, a, it's a weird form of anthropomorphism that I think we rarely think about, but, but is actually quite foundational to the way we think about the world. You know, going back to this idea of um, uh, the definition of umwelt, meaning environment and these sensory bubbles, and I think it's really, interesting you get into this in the book um that even though animals can share essentially the same physical environment because they have different tasks within that environment it actually pro uh, produces different uh niche umbelts uh mm -hmm. within so obviously i'm a fish head I, I'm oh, right. julie kind of suggested that in my introduction <laughs> i love fish i study fish and mike and i have studied fish together and I think it's so neat that if you think about fish who need to find other fish at a distance, they're going to have a very different umwelt than little fish who eat zooplankton at a short distance. And this simple what they how at what distance they detect their prey determines their sensory world, which then determines their signal world, right? Yeah. So these guys can't see UV, you don't want to see UV, right? Because that would scatter yeah. and create fog. These guys love UV and use it. And so it's so neat that the same environment can create, but depending on the task, can create constraints for one and opportunities for another. And I think the world is filled with this and all the different modalities that you've kind of tapped into. So it's just... It's yeah. layers upon layers within yeah, each and of these. Molly makes a really good historical point there because when we think of the ecological niche, like Molly said, we think of the places where animals live. And when we're talking about the umwelt, as you pointed out, we're talking about sensory areas in which animals uh, reside. The idea of the niche was suggested by this guy Grinnell just about the same time that von Uxel suggested this idea of the Umfeld, and they're so complementary, but they've been um, they've been in different branches of science for so long. So sensory biologists who were mainly neurobiologists were not thinking as much about how these sensory um, capabilities enhance the animal's ability to survive and reproduce. And that's really one of the things I think that your book does so well. You're not just talking about a visual system, how an animal sees, an auditory system, how an animal hears, but you're really bringing that out into the ecological realm, into the real world, and showing how important 
they are for the animal's ability to survive. With, with just wonderful, wonderful examples of how these sensory modes just plug right into the different niches of these different animals. Yeah, I, I thank you. I, I, I agree. And, um, you know, I think that the idea that, um, you know, there is not just one world out there, that it's partitioned into all these little tiny, tiny spaces, tiny opportunities that animals um, take up. Um, is is crucial, and that the and the idea that like the senses are tailored to an animal's needs, like over what range does it need to sense, like what kinds of signals are most useful to it, what what you know is it does it really does it care about predators or shelter or communication, like all, all of these things influence the way it perceives the world, and um, and is probably the reason one of the reasons why there's there are umbelts in the first place, um, that you know it nothing needs to sense everything. Um, so nothing does. Uh, and, and evolution is great at tailoring the senses to the animal's needs. And, and my favorite example of this, um, of this niche thing, which is uh, not about fish, sorry, Molly, but it is marine. <laughs> so, uh, so, you know, it, that's okay. Um, so in the deep ocean, there are um, a lot of creatures that uh, either like go all in on vision. So even though there's very little light, they have uh, very big eyes that are great at collecting the little light there is or biolum bioluminescence, like naturally, uh, biologically produced light, or that they'll go in on completely different set of senses and abandon vision altogether. And then there's the giant squid, um, which have the largest eyes in the animal kingdom. They have eyes that can grow up to the size of soccer balls. So they're huge things. And what's incredible about the giant squid is not just that their eyes are really big, but that their eyes are just not so much bigger than the next biggest eyes. So after the giant squid, the next biggest eye is a swordfish eye, which is also very big, but could fit inside the pupil of a giant squid's eye. So the question is not just why the giant squid has such a massive eye, but why does it need an eye that is so ridiculously massive compared to everything else? And the um, the answer, um, according to a bunch of vision scientists who, who've done a bunch of simulations about the kinds of things that a giant squid might like to see, is that an eye that big is really only excelling at seeing one kind of stimulus, which is like kind of a star field of light, like small points of light spread over a large area. And that's exactly the kind of thing that a sperm whale, which is the major predator of a giant squid, might produce as it's charging, because the deep mm -hmm. ocean is full of bioluminescent glowing small things, and a large object moving through that creates little flashes. So a human submersible does this when it goes down into the deep. You can sometimes, like deep sea explorers will talk about like seeing little like starbursts um, on the underside of their sub is exactly what a whale would do as it swims through the deep. And that seems to be what giants would have evolved to see. Um, the, you know, the, the shimmering outlines of charging whales, um, which I mean, uh, just kind of sets my heart on fire, right? Like it's, <laughs> um, it's beautiful. And, and I think that that's, it's such a wonderful answer for this weird bit of biology is this very iconic animal um, and it, it, you know, I think it speaks to the the niche idea that Molly uh, that Molly raised. Which I, I think it's just crucial. You know, the 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 world is full of all these opportunities, and the ways that animals have, have, have um, adapted to those to those different niches is is constantly fascinating to me. Yeah. Well, I think well, speaking of opportunities, I can think I just it's... ask one kind of irrelevant question before we go? <laughs> sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, okay. um, so for such a renowned author, and I assume a very efficient writer, you talk about your dog a lot. Why <laughs> did you name it Typo? <laughs> uh, we named it Typo Isn't that because obvious? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a good writer name, I think. Um, and, uh, you know, you, I think you want your dog name to be two syllables, uh, hard consonants. You want something that's easy mm -hmm. to, uh, to say with fondness, but also to be like, Typo! <laughs> um, he is typography when he is bad. Um, <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. I like it. Okay. Um, I think it's time that we open this up and, and let Julie navigate us through the, the question and answers that are, that are queuing up. 
Oh my gosh, you guys, this is the most fascinating conversation. I loved listening to it. And I love like both the broadness and the narrowness of it. And clearly everybody who's listening has really enjoyed it too, because we have great questions for you. Um, I'm going to go, I think in order of upvotes, because that seems like a good way to go. So the first one come from someone who is anonymous. Um, they write, what do each of you think is the most unappreciated animal talent or ability that occurs frequently in other animals, but not in us? And which one apparent superpower from an animal's experience would you choose to have if you could? <laughs> so I guess most unappreciated, and then what would you choose? So those are the two questions. I think we have to defer to let Ed go first. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Um... Okay, uh, so there's right because they're slightly different, right? Like I think, right. um, I think, an experience that I would that, that we don't have that I would love. Like we've talked about um, this question of uh, so echolocation in the water, specifically in the water, because it's this idea of navigating through sound works completely differently in in the ocean than in on land and than on land. So. Um, a bat is limited in the range at which it can echolocate over because sound loses energy very quickly in the air and a bat's call has to go out to an object and then back again. But in the water, sound travels much further. So a dolphin's echolocation um, can occur over much longer distances. You know, a, do a dolphin using its sonar um, can sense a massive swath of water around it. But it also, um, because water reflects, uh, sound, the sound reflects um, more um, when, it, when it encounters a change in density and because most flesh has the same kind of density as water, um, a dolphin sonar basically acts as a medical scanner. So it will, it will um, not only perceive like say the, the physical outline of a diver, but also like their skeleton, their lungs, um, a dolphin echolocating on a human would probably sense things like a fetus if the person was pregnant. You might be able to sense things like shrapnel um, if they were, you know, if they're carrying old injuries. Um, I think that would be incredible. Like, there's a sort of world of like being able to see inside other objects um, that we that normally seem opaque to us would be would be amazing, and then I think unappreciated. I I might steal what may be Molly's answer, but I think um, uh, ultraviolet light uh, is is a thing that is everywhere, and that uh, most I think most animals that can see can see UV, um, and that is something that most almost all humans do not do, and it means that there's this huge swath of signals out there um, that we are not privy to, but that have um, profoundly influenced the behavior and the evolution of a lot of the creatures around us. Um, so, you know, I think UV vision has, there's a long history of seeing UV vision as like this weird niche thing that only this group um, is capable of. And then that, you know, the group like expands as more and more creatures are, are, are shown to be, um, to, to have this skill, but it does seem to actually be very, very common. And I'm interested in things like that, where like, actually, uh, this is, this is something that humans don't have access to, but is very, very, um, very, very common in the rest of nature. Go ahead, Mike. <laughs> uh, under the underappreciated, this is uh, just seconding what Ed said earlier, I think is uh, magnetic perception because it's not an extension of a sense that we have so we can kind of guess. I just think it's totally uh, underappreciated because we have so little idea as to what it is. And um, a sense that I would like to have cautiously would be the olfactory senses of a dog. Uh, you know, Ed does the does this wonderful explanation of uh, typos behavior out <laughs> sniffing around and sniffing around and trying to imagine what it's sensing. So I would love to have that sense, but only for a couple of minutes because I'm afraid <laughs> it'll just make my brain explode. Hmm. Um, I think that uh, underappreciated is probably electrical sense. I'm absolutely fascinated, and I think it'd be fun to explore that. 
more. But in terms of what I would like, I'm going to stay humanly biased towards vision. And I would add polarized light mm. because it's it's something that a lot of invertebrates see. Actually, a lot of vertebrates can see it, but we don't understand why. And there's lots of controversy about how they might be able to see it. And I've studied a number of fish who can, and I'd love to see what they could see. So mm. <laughs> that's that's what I would add to my visual on those. Yeah, that, it, it's so fun to think about. It's, yeah, it takes you into really cool worlds. Okay, um, with similar number of upvotes, we have a question from Karen Jackson, and this is about the electrical sensing in plants uh, or uh, the plants electrical fields. Do you think that the plants have any ability to sense like our electrical fields or the animals electric fields? So turning it around on the plant side. That's a really and, good and, question. Yeah. I, so I don't know the answer to that. Um, I, and I think not to my knowledge with a huge caveat that that may just be because I don't know rather because the answer is no. Um, but I think there is some really interesting work um, in increasingly so of like what plants can actually sense. Um, you know, and this is, I think, a, a very rich field and does require you to flex your imagination in new ways. It makes you ask questions like what, what counts as sensing and, you know, what, how do you think about how um, think something like perception might operate in, in an organism is completely different to us as a plant. Like it's already, it can be already hard to do the same exercise for something like um, a scallop like, uh, you know, a, a kind of animal that a lot of people would only, wouldn't even think of as, as being an animal. Um, but I think when you get into plant territory, it, it becomes even more complicated. I mean, I, re I read, I wrote about a couple of papers that came out, uh, I don't know, like five years ago, it's pandemic time now, so maybe it's 10. Um, uh, but um, both of them were making, uh, were arguing that, plant, um, that plants can hear. Um, that they can uh, perceive and react to sound um, in important ways. And this is this is sort of a, a field that I think has been very controversial. Um, you know, there's a lot of like, uh, like um, pseudoscience and quackery around like, you know, playing classical music to your plants to make them grow faster. But like, these folks did some really interesting experiments showing that plants can respond to sound. And that in fact, like, in, in some cases, flowers, um, are sort of acting as an ear that they that they are acting as a um, as uh, the equivalent of a sense organ. Um, so yeah, this is not something that I know um, uh, that my expertise in is it, my expertise in this is is very 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 shallow. Um, but um, I feel like there is a there is and and will be really interesting companion books to an immense world written about like what sensing looks like from a plant perspective. Yeah, there, there are, there are some. I'm sorry, Molly. Do you, do you want to go? Oh, I was just going to say I don't know the answer to that, but I will just put put this out that Albert Einstein, who's considered, you know, the epitome right. of business, um, firmly believed that we human beings emitted energy waves. Hmm. So I'm not sure he put it along, you know, emotional energy waves, but he thought that we emitted energy waves and that at some point we'd be able to detect them. Maybe plants are better at it. We, <laughs> I'm just going to throw that out there. Right. Yeah, and certainly plants can sense a lot of things, um, you know, as Ed was pointing out with the electrical fields. They're very sensitive to vibration, so they can pick up an herbivore munching on a leaf, but they seem to have something analogous to a... Uh, to an animal nervous system where this results in increases of calcium, which are very important in nerve impulses that spread through our nervous system. And not only does this spread through different parts of the leaf, once it spreads to these parts of the leaf, it results in that part of the leaf mobilizing poisons, toxins that'll ward off the herbivores. And there's lots of, and there's lots of other examples where they seem to be in a sense, providing information about attacks of herbivores that other plants nearby can sense, and then they start to mobilize their defenses. So yeah, I think it's, um, I think there's still a lot, a lot, a lot to learn about how plants are sensing the world. Yeah, um, I'm going to 
there's a very high upvoted question, but I'm going to skip to another one just because I think it follows really well onto this question. Um, some Catherine Ramey wrote the idea of sensory sensory overload that you know, Mike, you kind of brought up um, is really compelling. Do you think that animals or plants could use sensory overload to confuse or distract distract their predators? And and I, you know, as you're talking about like you know plants changing their chemical composition to ward, you know, get get rid of predators. Like, what about this idea of like sensory overload? It's really interesting. Well, certainly in the marine world, a lot of animals use one modality to kind of uh, disrupt the predator while they're zooming away, which would be detected by a different modality. You know, I, I'm thinking of squid ink or something along those lines. You put a, a cloud and that often has an olfactory component to it as well. And so you, you, this is a brilliant idea, uh, Catherine or Kathleen were, you know, oh my gosh, I have to now process both olfactory and vision while my animal's zooming away and I can't use my my vision to to sense where it went. That, I love that idea. <laughs> yeah, and the, like um there are there are some some really cool examples in like um other sensory worlds outside of vision too, like um uh bats and moths have been engaged in this very long um, evolutionary arms race. Um, and some of the adaptations that moths have to counter bat zone are, are, are incredible to me. Um, so so um, a lot of people who've encountered moths before know that they're very scaly. Um, the, the scales can also function as a kind of acoustic armor. Like they, they, um, they just mess with the kind of echoes that bats um, receive when they produce their sonar calls um, and you know, distort um, the bat's perception of the flying moth. A lot of moths also have um, long tails streaming behind their wings, um, these long like flapping extensions. And it seems that those are also um, uh, like kind of acoustic decoys, like they they mess with um, the the um, the bat's perception of the moth. And if a bat, if an echolocating bat is attacking a moth with those long tail streamers, it will often go for the tail, bite them off, and the moth escapes. Um, and then there are also moths that do more active things. There are moths that actually produce jamming signals. They they produce clicks of their own that um, confuse and mess with um, the the, uh, the sonar calls of echolocating bats. Um, so yeah, there's uh, it's it's a great question, and there there are loads and loads of examples. I think, um, and it, it's it's interesting to me that there are loads of examples across. Um, the different senses. So, you know, vision, um, you know, you could easily imagine the case where an animal produces like a bright, flashy, um, uh, disruptive signal that is, that's off-putting to a predator. Um, but there are the equivalents in um, the acoustic world too. Um, it wouldn't surprise me if there are the equivalents in um, the electric in the electric world. And um, certainly electric fish can jam each other's signals and they often do that in um, uh, in competition with each other. Um, it, it wouldn't surprise me if they do that too, if there's some like anti-predator defenses that are like that too. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, I think we probably have time for this. I have to get this big question out there, which is where did the idea of the book come from? Oh, okay. So this is a this is a great story. And these are actually two great people to, to be on this, this answer. So um, the 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 uh, the idea from the book comes from my wife. Um, her name is Liz uh, Neely, and she um, currently works um, in science communication. She has her own um, consultancy called Liminal Creations, where she um, works with scientists on how to um, talk about their work, how to engage with the media, how to, you know, do be happier, ethical, uh, more ethical uh, members of, of our society. And um, she also, she um, started off doing her graduate work um, in sensory biology. Um, so she worked on the um, uh, the uh, color vision system, the color vision of coral reef fish with um, Gil Rosenthal, who I'm sure no, no, both of you know, right? Uh, <laughs> and she uh, she remembers meeting uh, both of you too. Um, so. 
we were sitting in a cafe in London in like late 2018 and I was going through uh, a, a, a what is very typical for me in the winter which is like a period of like morose um, self-flagellation where I talk about how where I think that my career has peaked and that I have no good ideas anymore and I knew I really wanted to write a second book but I didn't know what I wanted to write about and did people even need a book about um about you know cool animal biology anymore and uh Liz Liz told me to to pull my socks up and that um that the senses of animals would be a really good uh, and and largely unexplored area to uh, write a book about and she as always uh, was completely right uh, and so the idea for the book was her gift to me and I, I think of the book as my gift to her oh, I love that origin story nice. that's mm -hmm. beautiful and I couldn't help but um, notice that you wrote to Liz who sees me as <laughs> it's it, yeah it's yeah it's uh, you know um, uh, it it is a it is a hell of a move to write an entire book as a kind of anniversary present to your wife, but um, I, I mean, <laughs> it does does give you running points. Um, and yeah, you know, she she loves the field so much, and she knows that you know she 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 knows your both of you and your work, and um, you know she knows like Karen Walkington and Gill, and you know a lot of the a lot of the characters who appear in the book, um, and you know we we had we had a lot of very happy days um, in like throughout 2019 and at, uh, throughout 2020, like throughout the pandemic, just like going on, like, on long walks and talking and thinking about um, uh, the sensory worlds of other animals. That sounds like a great way to spend the pandemic. <laughs> yeah, it was. I <laughs> highly recommend. Yeah, it's interesting too, because it was in this time of isolation, right? And here you are expanding your sense of connection in a way. Yeah, yeah you know, I, I think that, um, these these past years have been hard on um, probably most people. Um, you know, I've I found them hard. Uh, the sense of isolation is difficult. Um, I think you know I've written about some very difficult stuff. I've written a lot of pieces about people who feel abandoned by their communities, by their their society. You know, I think it's it's a it's very easy to go. I think it would be very easy to do that work and come away feeling a bit despairing about our capacity for collective empathy and solidarity. And I do sometimes, but um, the fact that this book, which is almost entirely about empathy, it's it, at its core, it's about curiosity, joy, wonder, and, and empathy above all else, about perspective, radical acts of perspective taking, that, that a book like that could find its audience during this time um, reassures me, you know, makes me a little, a little more confident about, um, our path forward. And, um, it, it just, I think it just makes me happy that, um, that a lot of people seem to have grasped, like, the, the core conceit about the book, and that it is, the, it is a book about animals for their own sake. Um, and, and people seem to respond to that really well. Um, so yeah, it makes, it makes me happy. Um, it, it's, it's a very, it feels very validating for a lot of the, the interests and, and goals I've had in my work. Well, I can't think of a better way to end the session. Um, thank you guys all, the panelists, you guys were, this was so much fun. Um, such a bright way to end the week. And, <laughs> and, and um, really inspiring. I loved, I loved, I'm grateful to have been a part of it. I want to thank all of the audience for watching um, and for your great questions. I also want to remind everyone that this talk will be posted on the YouTube channel for the College of Natural Sciences. And one little last thing, if you want to um, join us tonight at Easy Tiger at the link at six o'clock, um, we will be having a little happy hour. And um, the last Texas Science Fest festival session is tomorrow. Um, it's a webinar with the McDonald Observatory about preparing for the pair of so solar eclipses that are happening in Texas soon. So thank you again. And I hope when you go out in the world this afternoon, you will perceive it just a little bit differently. <laughs> thank you, Julie. Mike and Molly, thank you so much. Yeah, uh, this what a total joy. Fun. Thanks. Thank Ed. you, Ed. It was a huge Thanks, honor. Julie. Thank you so much. Bye.